All right, good afternoon, good morning. You're joining us here for, uh, I guess, one of the, the first uh, learning sessions that we've had on the principles for locally led adaptation since they were launched um, at the Climate Adaptation Summit and first, I guess, the first learning event at Kabeshna uh, hosted in January. So anyway, to the session. Um, so I'm, uh, my name's Marek Sones. I'm a researcher at, in the International Institute for Environment and Development. Um, I am, uh, just to see, I'll just introduce you, I'll come over to you. Um, I am uh, um, one of the climate finance leads at IIED and have been working on the local led adaptation principles for the last couple of years. So it's a pleasure to be hosting this session with you all today. And we've got a fantastic session um, and lots of speakers, and lots of opportunities to interact. So I'm really looking forward to getting going. But just a, so a bit of the goals about the session today. So this is one of the, the second learning event as part of the eight principles for local led adaptation. Um, but this session is really about improving the CBA community's understanding and engagement with these eight principles to deepen your understanding and deeper our own understanding of what good practice uh, in them looks like and to unpack what implementation uh, may look like in practice and what the challenges may be. So our agenda today, we've got a mix of panel interviews uh, to cover the first four principles today. And we, we actually have a sister session tomorrow to cover the second four principles. So we're gonna have the first two principles interviews and I'll tell you who, through that, who that is in a moment, uh, followed by an opportunity to have a breakout session on one of those principles. And then we'll have an interview panel with the principles three and four, and then we will um, have another breakout session, be followed by some closing remarks from, from Sheila Vettel. Uh, so just before we get cracking, just to give everyone a bit of a recap of what these principles are. So uh, the Global Commission Adaptation actually launched a locally led action track um, a couple of years ago um, over its year of action. Um, and as part of that, IID, WRI, ECAD, some of those international, BRAC International, uh, along with many other organizations like the Huaro Commission and others, uh, collaborated to develop a set of eight principles for local adaptation, basically to help guide what collectively we thought um, good adaptation practice to support locally led action, put more power in the hands of local people look like, to guide the adaptation community. Now, in real brief terms, and in this session, the whole point is to get at deepen our understanding on the first four of those, those on the left-hand side. But just to quickly take you through what those are, they are about devolving decision-making to the lowest appropriate level. So closer to communities, placing more power in local communities, enterprises, and civil society organizations. Addressing the structural inequalities that prevent particularly excluded people from participating and owning their own adaptation, whether that be tenure rights or uh, rights to participate or power to participate. Providing more patient and predictable funding that can be more easily accessed by local communities, local governments, local enterprise. Investing in the capabilities of these local organizations so they are sustainable and can facilitate adaptation effectively over time. The fifth, to build a robust understanding of climate risk and uncertainty, recognizing that climate change is incredibly uncertain. We don't know how it's going to manifest in the, in the years to come, but we need to support adaptation on the ground that can deal and maximize around this uncertainty and particularly through flexible programming and learning that allows local communities to really thrive in doing different things, learning from how that happens and not recognizing failure of different things to be necessarily bad. And seventh is ensuring transparency and accountability so that communities, local governments, local enterprises really know where the money's going, what adaptation they can affect and participate in and be able to hold other actors accountable for their adaptation actions. And finally, collaborative action investment, recognizing we have a huge range of actors in play, whether they be public actors, civil society, private enterprise, but also different types of finance, overseas development systems, domestic finance, private finance, climate finance. This whole system needs to work effectively together across different layer, layers of governance across the whole of society to deliver adaptation effectively. So as I said, we're going to focus on the first four of these today, but basically we're in a real great time to have this session. We've got 50 endorsements to these principles so far. They've been growing steadily since the Climate Adaptation Summit in January that was hosted by the Dutch government. And actually most recently, the COP26 president, the UK government, which um, many of you may have engaged with so far, actually supported these eight principles as a good framework for supporting adaptation on the ground 
at their climate and development ministerial at the end of March. And the G7, which just finished last week, actually noted the principles as part of their foreign development office communique. So real political momentum rising and the usefulness of these principles. So we really, this session is incredibly important for keeping that tangible discussion with local actors going. And CBA, as I've said, is a critical part of the learning journey on these principles. So the three events that we've identified and the organizations, those 50 organizations that have endorsed and committed to learning around um, are Gaveshna, the community-based adaptation events, which we're here at today and development and climate based. So CBA and the community of those of you who are here today are incredibly important for maintaining the learning around, around uh, these new principles. So just before, I'm going to hand over to Saranjana Gupta from the Huaro Commission, who's going to be chairing our panel discussion today with four fantastic guests. So we have on the first principle, Sophie Deconic from Local, uh, Mia from the Yakum Emergency Unit, a Huaro Commission member, Jimmy Williams from Islamic Relief Worldwide, and Ayanka Granderson from Canari. And I'll let Saranjana introduce them more in a second. But just before we kick off, I saw a hand being raised. I think Sheila may have had uh, a comment. To raise. I just want to check if that's uh, if Sheila still wants to come in with that comment. No, I, I'm sorry. I was just checking the reactions. Uh, no sorry. problem. <laughs> Great. So reactions are working. Sheila's tested the reaction. So please do use them. Yeah, just to say the hands up function, if you do want to come in, you can use that hands up function. But just say if you do have any, as I said, any technical issues, Larissa Sitaro, who's our tech wizard behind the scenes, uh, can um, help you. So if you want to drop a message to her during this session if you're having any issues, please feel free to do so. Okay, so I think I'm going to be handing over to Saranjana now. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let Saranjana pick up the next phase of the talk. So over to you, Saranjana. Thank you, Marek. Hello, everyone. And I'm really very pleased to be here today at this session that's going to talk about not just the eight principles, but how are people actually thinking about putting these eight principles for locally led adaptation to work. So we have four very different speakers who represent different institutions who have endorsed the principles for locally led adaptation. And I'm going to talk to them a little bit about how they interpret these principles, uh, what they intend to do to put these principles into practice, and also some challenges that they might encounter on in their efforts to put these principles to work on the ground at the local level um, or wherever it is that their institution actually works. So um, without going into too many details, I thought let's hear what the, our guests have to say. And uh, let's start with uh, Sophie Deconic. She represents Locale. I don't see Sophie. Uh, hi, Sophie. And you're with Locale, which is the UNCDF's local program. And uh, you're going to talk about the devolved decision making principle and tell us how you see your organization putting this principle to work. So, if you first give us a, a couple of minutes on how you intend to put this principle to work. I'm then gonna ask you a follow-up question of what challenges you might face in doing so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suranja, uh, Suranjana, uh, for the question. So first, I'd like to clarify that uh, Local is not a program of UNCDF. Maybe it was born like that 10 years ago, but it's not anymore. Uh, it has evolved in what we understand uh, or present as a mechanism or an instrument some partners might use as terminology. So the reason for that is uh, because it's outgrown the earlier work of UNCDF. And in fact, it uh, provides a mechanism that is embedded in country systems, particularly decentralization processes and structures. And ensuring decision-making power is de facto using those structures devolved to the local level. So first to local governments, but from there working closely with communities so that they can um, be equipped with tools and supported with both financial resources and capacity building in case to identify adaptation responses that meet uh, their needs. So for that purpose, the instrument is called performance-based climate resilience grants and it's channeling finance uh, to the local level. 
So uh, as it's using uh, country systems, it's not creating parallel or project approach. And it leads also to scalability. So some of the earlier countries, because we started this work 10 years ago, like Bhutan have uh, scaled up to uh, 100 local government uh, over the years. So uh, it's a long-term effort, but that proved to be, to be scalable. Um, the principles also took to, to the assessment. So here we work on one hand on self-assessment, but also on third-party neutral assessment that are called uh, performance assessment that inform both capacity building, but also the finance. So we are talking about transparency, accountability. That is part of how it is uh, deployed. So uh, in a nutshell, that's what it is. Uh, it's now engaged with 28 countries, essentially least developed countries, 22 LDCs and six small island developing states. Uh, it's reached 100 million, uh, which is a, a drop in the ocean, but already still a, a decent amount to get started and hopefully uh, go to scale over the years. The countries govern it, uh, and we provide um, support to the countries participating. Thank you. Okay, let me stop you there, but let me quickly ask you for one cl clarification and another question. What is this performance-based thing? What what are you actually evaluating? And because that seems to be the uniqueness uh, about this uh, with this mechanism. So tell us, help us understand that, and also. Uh, what do you foresee as the challenges in moving forward? What might you have to rethink in the way in which you're putting this principle on devolved decision-making to work? Thank you. So effectively the performance element um, provides, so, so local governments are assessed every year against a range of pre-agreed target indicators. So at the time of setting up the system, those target indicators are designed and agreed on, and they cut across, for example, collection of uh, meteorological data, use of climate information, mainstreaming into the plans, participation, a uh, very important element, gender issues, environment, and um, also the good execution of the finance. So the local governments that score better get the next year a slightly bigger grant and related capacity building and vice versa. So that creates this positive emulation um, amongst local governments to improve across a range of issues, which is important to use the finance they get, but to change their operations more widely as well. Do you see yourself having to do anything differently in the next few years in order to advance this principle? Yeah, I think we, we are committed to, uh, well, last at the summit, uh, the CAS summit in January, we committed to try and double at least the size of the initiative over the next years because more and more countries uh, and partners and, and local governments uh, are coming to us to benefit from the mechanism. So that's one practical uh, commitment we've taken. We also committed to keep to, to in, increase um, the understanding of the local dynamics and feed that into the mechanism. So we're now working, planning um, a review of the portfolio with the World Resource Institute to um, assess how it is contributing to uh, the LLA principles or, sell, or a number of them. So that learning uh, will continue. And then we also work with countries so that they can directly access international climate funds like Green Climate Fund, so that we limit the number of intermediaries between those international climate funds and the local level. We work currently with 12 countries um, and that's about $200 million of portfolio moving limited, of course, by the size of accreditation of these uh, national entities. Uh, so we committed to continue working uh, along that line towards enhanced direct access um, to scale up and help more people benefit from climate finance. So thank you very much, Sophie. And I thought what was interesting there is that there seems to be a greater investment in more learning and feedback loops feeding back into the design of the process. What I liked is the, the performance-based indicators, which are worth uh, looking at. I think all of us should uh, take a look at that and see what we can learn from there and the flexibility and the, the resources and the capacities which you provide to local governments. Thank you very much, uh, Sophie. And Thank you. let's move on to the next panelist today. Uh, her name is Agnes or Mia. Mia works for Yakum Emergency Unit in Jogjakarta, Indonesia. Uh, they're a member of the Wairo Commission. Hi, I don't see Mia on the screen, are you there? Yes. 
I'm here. Ah, Hello, Sandhya. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon, Mia. Thank you for joining us. Um, Mia, you're going to speak about the second principle on locally led adaptation, which focuses on addressing structural inequalities and, and looking at the underlying uh, vulnerabilities and risks which allow vulnerabilities to climate change to persist over time, things that have accumulated and, and risk that has accumulated for a long time because of various social and political and economic processes. So now tell us how you, as Yakum Emergency Unit, interprets this principle and what you're gonna to do to implement it. Okay. Thank you, Suranjana, for the question, and hello, everyone. So uh, we are working with the rural community, like the grassroots women groups, and in traditional agricultural community, like uh, most women farmer group, they do not have the privilege of owning the farm and land plot, and that's why we need to have uh, encourage them or empower them to do more, uh, like traditionally or conventionally. Uh, access control and decision making in the traditional community belongs to uh, or generally with the men. So uh, we think that it, the first step we think about this principle is that uh, we need to provide opportunity for grassroots women, especially to have access control and decision making uh, of financial uh, resources. Like what we do is in the form of providing the uh, opportunity to manage the community resilience fund. Uh, it's a strategy like to stimulate their action or initiatives in adaptation. Uh, and second, since many grassroots women groups also do not have legal entity, so there is need to empower them to have a capacity in financial management and accountability standards, like uh, like in the bookkeeping and how to be eligible, so they can access funding from larger stakeholders. And later, uh, allow us also to share a short video from Warsila. She is one of the grassroots women groups that already has the best practices in strengthening their uh, her group. So they have like a better position in the community so they can uh, negotiate, negotiate with the decision-making in her village on how to access the programs from the government and also other stakeholders. Uh, Thank you. But before we go to Ibu Varsila's video, let me ask you, uh, what do you think, uh, what you described is the work that you're already doing, but in moving forward and expanding and strengthening and deepening this work, what do you think mm -hmm. are some of the major challenges which require you to think differently and to perhaps shift your strategies um, in empowering mm -hmm. Uh, marginalized and poor women to drive adaptation processes. Yes, like we think that the community racial fund strategy is a good and uh, proven effective in encouraging them, but they cannot do uh, the, the, the action or initiatives alone. So we need to have also linked with the local government and other stakeholders who hold the decision making uh, power. So we, uh, like in our government, we have the one and a half track strategy uh, where the government involves the non-government actors in decision making, like for example, in the development uh, planning and other sectoral issues issues, uh, forums, consultancy, and other uh, methods. But then we need, it is important also to strengthen the local grassroots women and their groups, also to build partnership with the government, uh, both local and, uh, and the up, uh, up, upper level, so that they can sit together with them to have a dialogue, like local to local dialogue, as a way to give influence uh, in the government and uh, decision making that they made with other stakeholders. Because by having the local to local dialogue, the grassroots women will learn about the decision making process of the pathway, even if they are not yet uh, taking the, the the decision making by themselves, but they know the the route or the pathway on how to to influence the decision making process and how to participate, uh, so they can voice their uh, their concern to the upper level. Okay, so you're basically saying that you're addressing structural inequalities, the inequalities mm -hmm. fa faced by women by pu putting more resources into their mm -hmm. hands, giving them the cap capacities to manage and control those resources mm -hmm. and use them for local mm -hmm. developmental and adaptation uh, priorities, and also giving them opportunities to learn about decision-making processes and how to influence them. Thank you so much. And let's... Yes. 
now before uh, we end your segment let's go and watch the video of ibu varsila who's a community leader from indonesia thank you thank you well, thanks all and thank you so much mia and um, we're going to try and do a quick video now saya varsila dari ketua kelompok wanita tani melati Dusun Watu Gajah, Giri Jati, Purwosari, Gunung Kidul, Daerah Istimewa Yogyakarta. Wilayah kami berada di deretan Pegunungan Seribu di pinggir pantai. Daerah kami termasuk daerah kering yang tergantung pada curah hujan. Dampaknya, satu kekurangan air, dua menurunnya hasil pertanian, dan tiga pendapatan berkurang. Pada awalnya, kami mengalami kesulitan untuk melakukan pertanian adaptif iklim karena semua kegiatan pertanian masih didominasi oleh laki-laki dan keterbatasan lahan. Upaya yang kita lakukan adalah satu, budidaya tanaman yang tahan kekeringan seperti padi umur pendek, dua, pembuatan pakan ternak alternatif, tiga, pembuatan pestisida hayati, dan empat budidaya ternak kambing. Kelompok kami bekerja sama dengan pemerintah desa dan balai penyuluhan pertanian dalam melakukan kegiatan ini. Kerjasama ini terjalin karena adanya partisipasi dari kelompok di berbagai kegiatan ataupun rapat di tingkat desa ataupun bersama balai penyuluhan pertanian atau BPP. Kelompok kami mendaftarkan ke BPP untuk mendapatkan legalitas berupa nomor register dengan begitu kelompok kami mudah mendapatkan fasilitas dan bantuan upaya yang kami lakukan untuk pendekatan dengan pemerintah diantaranya pertama mengikuti rapat kedua menerapkan kegiatan dari hasil rapat ketiga melibatkan BPP dalam setiap kegiatan kelompok kami setelah kegiatan kami berjalan, kelompok kami mendapatkan dukungan berupa bantuan benih tanaman, pelatihan, dan mendapatkan peralatan. Selain itu, kami ikut terlibat dalam perencanaan pembangunan desa dengan mengikuti musyawarah tingkat dusun dan desa. Kami mengusulkan berbagai kegiatan seperti fasilitas pelatihan dan peralatan pertanian. Pada saat ini, kami sedang melakukan kegiatan pembibitan buah dan sayur, budidaya tanaman, ternak kambing, klinik PHT, atau pengendalian hama terpadu. Dalam hal ini, kami selalu didampingi oleh BPP serta pihak desa. Pendampingan ini sangat penting bagi kelompok kami karena dapat meningkatkan pengetahuan dan keterampilan serta dapat memperluas jaringan kerjasama. Kami berharap selalu mendapatkan pendampingan serta dilibatkan dalam perencanaan pembangunan desa. Untuk kedepannya, rencana yang akan kami lakukan sebagai kelompok penyedia tanaman, penyedia pestisida hayati, melakukan pengolahan hasil pertanian serta menjalin kerjasama dengan pemerintah dan pihak terkait. Demikian pengalaman dan berbagai kegiatan yang kelompok kami lakukan. Semoga dapat menjadi inspirasi bagi perempuan-perempuan dalam melakukan aksi di tingkat lokal. Fantastic. So hopefully that worked for everyone. And thank you, Mia, so much for, um, for introducing the, the Borough Commission, the Ucom Emergency Trust and the video. That was fantastic. So moving on now, we all have an opportunity for everyone to share their own thoughts on those first two principles. So we've heard some uh, two examples from Lokal and uh, Yukum Emergency, uh, how they're thinking about principle one, development decision making, and principle two, um, around um, addressing structural inequalities. Now it's an opportunity for you to provide your input. So we've got two questions for the breakouts. What does implementation of this principle mean in practice for an endorsing organisation or any organisation? And what are the challenges to an institution in implementing this principle in practice? So what does implementation actually look like, actually delivering devolved decision making or addressing structural inequalities? And what are the challenges in the current system or for your organization for doing that? So I'm sure that was probably too tight a time to really, I'm sure there was some, hopefully there's some great points raised. I popped my head in uh, to I think everyone's breakout group. Um, 
Uh, so we're running a bit behind schedule. So Marek, we still have people coming back. All right. So okay. if you can give it just around 30 seconds. No worries. Thanks, Lisa. So we're running. Um, so thank you, everyone. I put my head in, head in most uh, breakout groups and everything seems to be going re uh, some really detailed discussion. We're running a little bit behind schedule. Um, so we're going to skip the plenary report back verbally. Um, but what we're going to do is um, I'm just going to ask everyone what we're going to do is something called the chat shower. So I'm just going to share my screen really, really, really quickly. And basically all it simply is, uh, is I'm just going to go and ask you in a moment so you're going to have about um, 20 seconds to uh, have, a, have a little think about uh, the answer to this question. So what you're going to do is a quick chat show question about what was the biggest challenge that you heard in your group to operationalizing the principle, whether that be devolving decision making to the lowest level level, uh, to the most appropriate level, or to addressing structural inequalities. What was the biggest challenge you thought? And just, uh, just have a think about that and I'll start the time in a second. And basically what I want you to do is in a 20 seconds time when I say go, everyone to don't send it yet, but get ready to send it in the chat box. And when I say go, everyone to pop their comments in the chat box. And don't worry if you click it too soon, no problem. But just maybe wait for, uh, for 20 seconds, which I'm just starting now to have a think. And just to say, uh, while you're having a think about what the biggest challenge you thought for operationalizing the principle was, please do keep your Jamboard links. If you did use a Jamboard, keep them open. Uh, for the whole session, you can add further thoughts and comments on the challenges or how to operationalize them throughout the session and after the session. So we can keep those jam boards for you to keep adding those ideas. So is everyone ready? My colleagues do spirit fingers. I'm not going to do that. I'm not quite as good at doing that. But um, um, ready, steady, go to pop your idea in the chat box. See what we've got coming out. Got plenty of ideas popping in. Great. Fantastic. So about needing to build a capacity of local organizations, fifth, shifting perceptions, the transparency is absolutely key. Definitional issues are really important. Need to accept learning, uh, lack of understanding of participatory processes. This is fantastic. Really, really great. Thank you very much. All right. So in the interest of time, We've now uh, such a busy packed agenda. We're now going to hand back to Suranjana in a moment to take us through the final two panelists in our sessions. So, so, um, so we first heard from uh, Mia from Yakum Emergency Unit and Sophie Deconic from Local. So, in the, uh, the next panel discussion before we go into breakouts again, uh, this time hopefully it'll be all moving smoothly. We've got Jamie Williams from Islamic Relief, um, who's going to talk about the, uh, providing patient predictable funding. Um, the challenges around that, and we've got the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute, INCF, um, on investing in local capabilities to leave institutional legacies. So I'm going to stop, stop sharing my screen and hand over to Soren Janet. Thanks, Mike. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am going to talk to Jamie Williams of Islamic Relief to talk about, uh, to find out more about what he thinks are some of the major concerns and challenges around providing patient and predictable uh, funding to communities. I think uh, for those of us who work with communities at the local level, this is a really uh, critical issue because most project funding uh, provides money in a siloed, lumpy short-term way to communities. And just as things are sort of starting to take shape and you know, after three years, communities are actually uh, in a building capability and starting to move forward, suddenly project funding ends and their support you know, is over and they, they, they're stuck. And uh, so the idea of doing work that is transformative and actually changes the lives of poor people requires patient funding. I think funding that is provided and from which funders learn and, and, and stay and trust a process and stay with it over a period of time instead of asking for quick success 
And, and the predictable nature has to do with a steady flow of funding that communities can expect to continue their work over a period of time and, and to test, to innovate, to scale up and so on. So with that, I'm going to ask Jamie Williams what he thinks of this particular principle on patient and predictable funding and what his experience has been uh, in trying to get patient and predictable funding to communities that Islamic Relief works with. Hi, Jamie, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, your experience in Islamic Relief on trying to get uh, longer term funding and what kinds of barriers you've come up against. Unmute yourself, Jamie. Um, Oh, that's always a good idea, isn't it? Um, uh, thank you, Saranjana. Uh, I, I would really, uh, Islamic Relief, we, we calculated in September last year that we were working in 20 countries on about 50 projects which are climate adaptation related. Um, so we've we've got very broad. We 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 our whole model is working locally. Uh, we have a very particular in with a lot of um, hard to reach communities uh, that we take advantage of, and um, I think I'll just make it clear that our funding primarily comes from donors to our organisation. So. Uh, essentially it's people putting their hands in their pockets and and handing over the money especially during uh, ramadan and uh, and the eids to islamic relief in the united states in germany in uk um, and that's that's our source of funding so that might seem that it's um quite easy to uh say right we're going to have long-term funding i mean when, when we talk about patient when we talk about predictable uh, i would say and i think it's generally accepted that that's sort of a five to seven year span where the where the money needs to be available um so we put it to our donors um yeah we want a consistent funding um but it really doesn't it's not easy at all uh there needs people are used to giving money they see that there's a disaster in in uh, east africa and they put their hands in their pockets and give to that disaster that's a sort of level that most of the people who give us money are at what we need to do is first of all develop products that we can sell to our donors that say right well you're committing yourself to a longer term thing we do have uh, child sponsorship schemes um, which are far more sophisticated than they sound actually with that name that entire uh, that uh, naming but uh, we need to develop that into project work um, and have products like child sponsorship that we can sell to people. But also we need to educate, we need our people, the people who are giving us money to know that we need this long-term uh, commitment because the communities that we work with, as you said, Saranjana, need that consistency in order to make, uh, to have an effective intervention. Um, so th that said, that we are in this rather rarefied state we're not looking to uh, institutional donors but i guess that we're going to find a very similar answer possibly from other organizations that, that are more like bilateral funded multilateral funded so what's been your experience um in in bangladesh for example uh, where you've had an opportunity to get slightly longer term funding and what have you learned from that What we have in Bangladesh is a, a, a period of um, 25 years of um, funding more by, let's say, accident than design. It wasn't set out in 1995 to be this is what we're going to this is what we're going to do. But as it happens, the funding has been consistent. Um, it's not that we've been working with individual communities, but our model has been one of sustainability. So we go back to communities we were working with in the early 2000s, and we find that the, the institutions that we established that were established under our programs there are still maintained. And, and this system has been picked up by, uh, by bigger organizations, UNDP, for instance, as being a model of work. But the effectiveness of it is entirely due to this consistency. It's been the commitment the Islamic Relief Bangladesh made in order to keep following uh, project after project 
um, where we were, it was an iterative process where we were learning, we were learning, and that learning was easily communicable to the communities that were, that, that were doing the actual work. Um, and we came up with a, there is a model now of work in Bangladesh, which is, which is properly celebrated throughout the world. So I think that that shows the strength. It's, um, I'm talking very generally, and forgive me, I'm, I'm, I work with Islamic Relief Worldwide, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not there in Bangladesh uh, with the people who are most affected by uh, by climate disaster, um, I feel that uh, Islamic Relief Worldwide is an umbrella for a lot of people who are in that position, who are themselves being empowered to make a difference to their uh, ability to adapt and their ability to survive uh, in those contexts. So, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a, uh, an old white bloke, as you can see, talking from UK, but I hope that what I have to say resonates um, because. You know, like you can you can draw on the experience of, of people in the field, not just in Bangladesh, but but throughout Asia and, and East and West Africa. Thank you so much, Jamie. I think the point you made about working with individual donors who are used to giving money for what are big visible emergencies is a very important point. And I think many people who are working on more long-term issues are struggling with that. Um, I think uh, it's, it's also the case with many institutional donors and philanthropists that they prefer to provide funding for those kinds of uh, more sort of short-term visible things. So with that, I'm going to close the segment with you. Thanks so much, Jamie. And let's go to our next guest. She is Yanka Granderson from Canary in the Caribbean. It's very early in the morning there, that much I know. Yes, it is. Hi, well, good morning. <laughs> good morning. morning. You made it. Uh, welcome and thank you for being with us today, Ayinka. And uh, I'm going to start by asking you to give us a couple of sentences that help us understand what Canary does and uh, how do you interpret this principle number four that talks about investing in local capabilities in ways that leaves behind a legacy. So thanks to Ranjana um, for the introduction and also thanks to the IIED team for the opportunity to engage. Um, greetings to everybody from not so sunny Trinidad. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with us, the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute, or Canary for short, is a regional nonprofit technical institute that has worked uh, for over 30 years across the Caribbean islands to promote stakeholder participation and stewardship of natural resources and the development of sustainable rural livelihoods with local communities, resource users, and partners from government and the private sector. So for us, uh, in terms of principle four um, on investing in local capabilities, uh, we have been focusing on strengthening civil society organizations, including community-based organizations and local resource user groups like Fisherful cooperatives and associations and other local institutions like you know, community level committees and village councils so they can play a more significant role in designing and implementing adaptation and resilience actions, as well as in climate change advocacy and influencing policy over the long term. And this is a specific area of focus on our new resilience program that I manage, which aims to build the resilience of local communities, their livelihoods, and the ecosystems they depend on um, to climate change and other disasters. And I think uh, without strong and effectively run organizations, you know, the efforts by community-based organizations, local resource users, et cetera, really can't be sustained or scaled up for impact. Um, and so one of the, some of the key areas that we've been looking at in terms of strengthening um, have been financial management for sustainability, human resource management and succession planning, strategic planning, good governance, as well as partnership building. And so... Oh. Uh, the one last thing I wanted to say is that we try to take a really multi-pronged approach to that strengthening, um, recognizing, for example, that one-off training is 
absolutely not effective. And so we really look at doing both targeted training based on needs assessment, but also peer learning and exchanges to share experiences and lessons small grants to really support learning by doing and pilot innovation, as well as coaching and mentoring um, with the organizations. And we've really found that these small grants and the one-on-one -on -one mentoring um, with a trained and experienced mentor over at least like one and a half to two years has been particularly effective for local organizations that we work with, including Fisher Folk Associations, etc. And so, you know, we've really been looking at establishing a regional network of mentors and training them up on how to really do that organizational strengthening properly, um, drawing on the lessons that we've learned over the last 10 years or more. So that sounds like something new that you're, you're looking at doing this, this network of mentors that is going to stay with, you know, handholding other people within the network over a period of time. Is there anything else? Do you foresee any kind of challenges that are pushing you to rethink your capacity development strategies? Yeah, so I think one other area that's new for us is that we've been expanding our focus to looking at how we can strengthen local community small and micro enterprises in addition to these local organizations and institutions particularly those within the informal sector recognizing that these are really critical for resilient local livelihoods as well as resilient ecosystems because many of them are natural resource based um, and they're an important pathway we see for the transition to a more inclusive blue and green economy and resilient development. And so we've been piloting tools recently that we're gonna to try to scale up and actually one of them showcased in the CBA 15 marketplace on climate proofing and strengthening local green enterprises in the Caribbean. Um, so people can check that out to see more about what we're doing. But I think in terms of the key challenges uh, for our work on sort of strengthening local organizations and now enterprises um, is that it really requires sustained efforts and commitment from both the target organizations and enterprises, but also their partners and funders. And in particular, we really need longer term programmatic support. Um, and this requires a shift, not just from that project based for support that we typically see to programmatic support um, that's flexible and tailored to the needs of these different types of organizations and enterprises, but also a shift from that narrow focus on technical training and assistance to really supporting organizational capacity building and strengthening more broadly and specifically. Um, and we feel it would be really valuable as well for a lot of these organizations to have direct access to funding to really empower them to direct their own development and work, as well as to support them to better partner with government and private sector, uh, particularly based on what I think Jamie just highlighted under principle three and that discussion around more patient um, and flexible sort of funding. Thank you, Ainka. I think uh, you said some really important things. A couple of things that stood out to me is just not just technical support for something narrow, but broader organizational development, not just uh, looking at uh, a, a technical change in the way in which enterprise is, is undertaken, but shifting relationships and building partnerships with government and other actors. I think both those sort of point to the need to kind of broaden our approach, create more integrated approaches to supporting locally focused organizations to drive adaptation. So let me stop there and thank you very much and hand it back to Marek. Thank you very much, Sue and Jana. And thank you, Ayanka and Jamie. That was fantastic to provide, again, some brilliant ideas for the breakouts. Now, hopefully this time you all know what you're doing, but um, just to quickly give you um, that overview again. Uh, we're going to do the same thing with going into uh, two sets of breakouts. So you've got to the side of the breakout group again and ask, we're going to be asking again two questions. What does implementation of the principle look like in practice and what are the challenges? Now just a quick note to rapporteurs. Apparently I've made an error in the facilitation guidelines. Rapporteurs, please go into the same breakout groups as you did last time. Same breakout groups as you did last time. We're not changing it up. So apologies for that. So uh, these are the groups again. So for principle three, we've got uh, three groups, A, B, and C, and principle four, A, B, and C. 
and and this is what it looked like last time. So I've just got it actually up. I take the screenshot to avoid the carnage. Uh, is again, this will pop up. If it doesn't, you click on the breakout uh, icon at the bottom right. And if not, just message me or Louisa or just pop or just say it, and we can pop you in a breakout group of your choice. So um, we've got around 20 to 25 minutes, a bit less because we're running slightly behind schedule. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and allow um, uh, Larissa to open the breakout groups again. So if you'd like to do principle three, you've got your first three groups to choose from. Principle four on investing in local capabilities to choose from the last, two, uh, the last three groups. Hey, everyone. Everyone starts to trickle in. Hopefully you had a, another really great discussion there in the principle three and four. Great. All right, everyone's back from breakouts. Hopefully you had a really another rich discussion. Again, I popped my head around in a few meetings and it was it sounded really fantastic. Really, um, yeah, really getting in, especially the challenges of, of, of really operationalizing, operationalizing these principles. So um, again, we're just, we're really close to time now and I wanna leave enough time um, to um, allow a bit of comments potentially from Sheila if she is able to. Um, but also um, uh, to tell you a bit about tomorrow's session and give you a bit of information about how you can continue to stay engaged in these principles. So we're going to do another chat shower um, just to get everyone's kind of headline comments again on some of the challenges. But just before I do that, I just want to emphasize that if you, if you did manage to use the Jamboards in your sessions, if you may keep those Jamboards open, and if you maybe save the link to that Jamboard somewhere, you can continue to access that Jamboard. So if you still have any ideas um, after the session, or even if you're joining the session tomorrow and you have ideas on the principles we covered today, you can continue to think about that, whether that be ideas on implementing the principle, if you've got some kit examples that really highlight that well, or some challenges, you can add that in. So please do keep those Jamboard links and you can keep those ideas rolling in. So as we did for the previous uh, question, I'm just gonna, let me just pop up my uh, previous slide that we had. Um, so just a quick chat shower given the time we've got very limited time left so again like last time it just give you 20 seconds to mull over to so think about it type it into the chat but don't click send what what uh, was the biggest challenge you thought in operationalizing uh, the principle that you were discussing what for you either whether it was either your thought or a thought from another colleague in your breakout group what was the real challenge that hit home to you about operationalizing uh, either principle three on patient and predictable funding or patient uh, principle four in investing in local capabilities to leave an institutional legacy? What was your real big challenge? Give a few more seconds to think. Hold your, hold your, uh, if, if you're quick send, don't worry, but try and hold that for a few more seconds. Give it uh, five more seconds. So five, four, three, two, one. Click enter, click send, see what ideas we've got coming in. Uh, now I can't see the chat, so I can't see it. <laughs> Aha, there it is. So we need to focus on monitoring progress and impact in local capabilities. Um, we need uh, recommendations from implementing from each constituency. That's really great. So recognizing the difference, the practicality of these principles are for different stakeholders in adaptation. Um, donors aren't always patient that they need to do some learning from that. We need to influence their mindset. Um, we need to change the narrative from aid, recognize it away from charities, our top-down responses. Uh, great, some great ideas there. Keep them coming in, so that was fantastic. Uh, so just before I give you a bit more information about the next session, so I just wondered if I wanted to hand over to um, if Sheila Patel. So we've got Sheila here, who you may have met in a couple of groups. Um, and I think we'll also be speaking tomorrow. Sheila used to be, uh, well, I guess still technically is, the, um, uh, the one of the commissioner from the Global Commission Adaptation, particularly really helping the political support around the local action track um, before the commission sunset. So I just wanted to pass over to Sheila to add a few remarks on what she's heard today, particularly from the panel discussions, but also um, in, the, in the breakout group you were in on, on what are we hearing in terms of the, the ways to practically implement these first four principles and the challenges in doing so. Just to pass over to you, Sheila, for a couple of minutes. 
I think my first reflection is that we need to have many more of these discussions, both within our own organizations and between all the different stakeholders who we believe have to change. But the more we think about it, the more uh, reactions we get about the changes we need to do amongst our own functioning, our own asks, our own ways of functioning. And the, the collective asks that we have of those institutions uh, whose inability to change and move seems very difficult when we deal with them individually. So that's the sense that I get. And I think that especially in championing uh, adapt, local adaptation, these breakthroughs are going to be very important. And I think that what came out very strongly for me is that the, the extent to which we've presently been able to utilize the accountability sort of national and international organizations have helped us breach the sort of opaqueness of uh, how choices of aid, timing, types of resources going where have begun. So our education being as grassroots organizations and intermediary organizations will only improve and en get enhanced as we learn to understand how they function, what they do, and begin to develop relationships with those institutions, people within those institutions. Because institutions don't change just out of external barraging, but also from internal uh, changes that leadership there brings in. But I also feel that all of us as intermediary institutions have to reflect on how we have been very reactive on our own roles, what we have accepted as aid and assistance, even though we know it's dysfunctional, and how we've been caught in a trap of accepting things and actions and monitoring and evaluation systems that are not 365 degrees. So we allow everybody to intrude into what we do, but we don't ask people to give us money to look at how they look at these things. So I'll just stop here, but the, the, it would be fantastic to get all the shower that you have done to help me coalesce these things. But, but I feel that even in our work on principles, because there's going to be no silver bullet. We just have to struggle through lots of things that lots of us have to do. And I think the more people who join this process and feel accountable to them, uh, the more effective we'll be. And basically it's going to be staying power. You know, can, we, can we track this year after year and, and, and call duty bearers to be transparent about why they do what they do? Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Sheila. That's fantastic. That's some fantastic. It's a real food for thought, especially uh, given tomorrow we're going to be one of the principles we'll be talking about is is transparency and accountability. And I can um, wrap up the session in just one second, but just to give you um, a bit of information. Um, obviously, you know, with the CBA this year, we have the Slack channel. And I have created a specific channel on the principles for local adaptation currently. There's four people in it. It's just for my ID. So I please invite all of you who participated today to please join that and join the discussion and add some of the thoughts from, that you heard today, share some stories. And we also um, really do um, uh, ask that those who have endorsed the principles um, uh, and we're going to do the same thing. We're going to post our endorsement to the principles on that Slack channel so people can have a look at it, provide comments, even provide some critique on ourselves. We do uh, promote that others who have endorsed it, please do the same. If you're looking for some examples of what the principles are and what they may mean, we did a collaborative paper that came out in January, which is on this, but we'll share these slides, I believe, and we'll be consolidating all of these great notes, your great input. So thank you hugely for, the, uh, for participating in the session. And just to say before we finish, a huge thank you, obviously, for Sheila for wrapping up with those comments, but also all our facilitators, Mr. Karsaki, Aisha, um, Christina, Barry, 
all our rapporteurs. Um, I'm sorry, I can't, um, I'm just not going to rattle off everyone's name, but thank you for all the notes that you've been keeping. Um, and thank you, Larissa, for being the tech wizard in the background. And also thank you for to Sam for doing all the organisation. So um, thank you hugely. And I'm just, before I'm wrapping up, I'm just seeing I've got a hand raised from Jamie. So, yeah, um, Merrick, can you just add the, the that link that's on the screen? Yeah, to add that to the chat. So I'll add it to it. the chat. Yep, I'll, add it. I'll just have to stop sharing my screen, but I'll add it to the chat right away before I finish the session. Oh. Um, Merrick, you might have to do something because it's not actually visible at the moment. The locally led adaptation channel. I just jumped into Slack. Okay. Yep. Uh, cool. I will make sure. Um, I will investigate that. It's all learning for me as well. So if I can't use it, I don't think anyone else. Uh, people other people are going to have a struggle accessing that so i obviously need to do some learning myself so there's the slack channel link and i will pop the um the paper link in there and i will make sure that i follow with all of you who on the session about how to actually engage in that slack channel so i'm making it actually transparent and engageable so thank you very much for engaging and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow at the same time for the next four principles so yeah just one final thank you and i'll end it there so yeah, have a good have a good lunch if it's your lunch time. Have a good uh, hopefully have a nice evening or or any other sessions that you're joining later this afternoon UK time. Thanks very much. <laughs>